Good morning. Yeah, that's kind of what I thought. Monday morning. I was trying to put myself in your seat and imagine what I would want to hear, if anything, on a Monday morning. Because probably you stayed up too late last night. If you're a girl, it's a good chance you started a new diet today, so you're already cranky. <laughs> so I was trying to think when I went to, I went to seminary in London, England, and I was trying to think, if somebody could have told me two things on a Monday morning, what would I have wanted to hear? And I thought, maybe this. Um, all exams have been canceled. <laughs> because God just thinks you're A+. Plus. Every one of you. And someone anon anonymously um, puts $10,000 in each of your checking accounts. We don't know who, but just, you know, God bless. So thank you, and that's it, really. No. No, actually, I thought what I would have wanted to hear was that everything that I hoped and dared to believe about God is even greater than it is, than what I already believe. I gave my life to Christ when I was 11. I'm now 57. So that is a lot of years of walking with God. And I have to tell you, I feel as if I'm only beginning to get a taste of the breadth and the height and the length and the depth of God's ridiculous, overwhelming, fiery love and grace. One of my favorite authors is A.W. Tozer. I don't know if you have any Tozer fans in here. He made an interesting quote that has had me thinking a lot recently. I'm sure you are familiar with the quote. Um, what comes to your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. What comes to your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. Now, depending on your background, your answer will probably be different. If some of you had a very harsh childhood, if you were raised by a father who was distant or unloving or even abusive, it's hard not to project that onto God and think that God too is maybe disappointed in you or maybe a little distant or maybe just a little unconcerned about your life. But if you were brought up in a place where you really felt like you ticked all the right boxes, you know, and you did what you're supposed to do, you may be in the place where you think that, um, that every morning when you wake up, God thinks, well, great, at least we've got her. At least we've got him. Here's one that's going to get it right today, no matter how many other people mess up. I grew up a little bit like that. I was born on the west coast of Scotland, raised in a very small Baptist church that my family had been in for generations. In fact, the communion table was made by my great, great grandfather. And I really thought I knew what faith looked like. And then I went to seminary in London. And there were students there from 32 different countries around the world. And from, it was very mixed denominationally. And that was confusing for me at first because I knew what faith looked like but all the Anglicans drank. And I'm like, well, I know you're not gonna lose your place in heaven, but you're definitely gonna get an obstructed view. There's no doubt about it. Then I left um, seminary and joined Youth for Christ and moved to Holland and worked in Holland and all the Dutch Youth for Christ people smoked. And I'm like, Lord, are you aware of what is happening on this planet that you created? And it really, it set up in me a struggle as to work out what really actually matters. What is God really looking for in you and in me? Because the truth is that we are all broken, but we just, some of us do a much better job of hiding it. I love that verse at the end um, of the story of Zacchaeus. You know, that's the only Scottish person in the New Testament. A wee, wee man. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. 
But Luke 19, 11 says this, for the son of man keep to seek and to save those who are lost. Now, lost can mean all sorts of things in our culture. You've lost your keys. You've lost your dog. Here, that little Greek word, apolymai, means devastated, ruined, broken beyond repair. That reads a little differently. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are devastated, ruined, broken beyond repair. It took me a long time in my Christian walk to come to a place of understanding that that is not the bad news, that's actually the good news. As Johnny said, for the last 17 years, I've worked with women of faith, and we've had the privilege of welcoming five million women. But I'll never forget that phone call, the day that someone called and said, we're starting this new conference for women. We would really like you to come and be one of the speakers. The first event you'll speak at will be in Hawaii. <laughs> yep, somebody's got to go. Those people need the Lord too, you know. And you'll probably be speaking to about 10 And all I could think of was, was, should I tell them? Should I tell them? And I thought, no. No, I'm not going to tell them. Because if I tell them, then I'm not going to Hawaii. What they didn't know, and what they did not know actually for the first two years, is that I had never spoken in public before in my life. They assumed I had because my background is television. I worked for five years with the BBC in London, hosting a live um, gospel rock show. Then I worked for five years co-hosting the 700 Club with Dr. Pat Robertson. I was also a contemporary music artist. So sometimes if your face is familiar, people think, well, she's a speaker. I had never spoken before in my life. I had no desire to speak. The only time I'd done it was once, and I did it as a favor for a friend. Have you ever said to a friend you'll do something because you're in a kind of a good mood? And then you actually have to do it, and you're like, why did I say I would do that? Well, that's what happened to me. I was doing my master's in theology at Fuller Seminary in Pasadena, and I was going out of the door one day to class, and my phone rang, and it was my best friend, Marlene. And she said, Sheila, what are you doing? And I said, nothing. Do you want me to do something? She said, well, actually, Saturday, would you be willing to drive to Palm Springs and speak at a private country club for women? And I said, no. And she said, but I need you to. I said, Marlene, it's not that I'm not willing to. I don't know how to do that. I mean, people who speak have talks. I mean, it's something they've actually done before. You can't just show up at a country club and just you know, share your shopping list. So I said, I'd love to, but I can't. And I said, let's face it, you already know almost every Christian woman in America who speaks. And this is exactly what she said to me. I've called them all, you're the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> Seriously. So I said, well, because I love you, I will do it, but please make it clear that this was the best you could get. So I woke up that morning and I thought, why did I say I would do this? I mean, I was a student. Most of my clothes were just blue jeans and T-shirts. And Palm Springs is pretty ritzy. So I got in my little car, and I'm driving the two hours from where I lived to Palm Springs. And I'm talking to the Lord, basically saying, I just want to apologize right now because you are not going to look good today. <laughs> so I got there, and it was worse than I thought. I mean, manicured lawns, women driving up in their little chauffeur-driven limousines, little Chanel suits, perfect makeup, faces, interestingly enough, that didn't move, but that's a whole other thing. <laughs> Ask the girls. Um, and so I, walked, I, got, I went inside, and it was this huge ballroom, a thousand women, crystal and china and and I sat at the head table beside the most stunningly beautiful woman I have ever seen in my life. Tall, willowy, blonde, perfect face. The kind of woman you look at and think, really, Lord, share the love a little. Hello. <laughs> well, finally, they introduced me. And I stood at the podium with nothing to say. And I had one of those... Return now, Lord, moments. But he seemed reluctant. 
So I, I had one of those prayers where I was just literally, Lord, what do I do? And I heard God say, just tell the truth. All right. So I said, um, hello, my name is Sheila, and eight weeks ago, I was released from a psychiatric hospital. That's a great opening line if you ever want to use it. <laughs> but for me, it was absolutely the truth. I'd spent all my life running from that place. Brought up in Scotland by Christian parents, which would not be unusual in America, but in Scotland, less than 2% of our population even go to church. So to have a mom and dad who loved God was quite a gift. But when I was five years old, my father had a massive brain aneurysm, and it turned his personality from being loving and kind to being a frightening stranger. And when I was five years old, my father tried to kill me, tried to bring his cane down on my skull, but I pulled it and knocked him off his balance, and he was taken off to what was called our local asylum, a horrible old hospital on the hill. He was 34 years old. And he was placed in a maximum security ward because he'd become violent. And he escaped. Um, my mom asked if he could be moved to a ward with some younger men, and they agreed, but it meant it was less secure. And on the first night he was placed in that ward, he escaped. And they looked for him all through the night and found him in the morning. He was, he'd taken his own life in the river. He was dead, caught in the salmon nets. <clears throat> and in Scotland in those days, you don't take children to funerals. All I knew was my mom came home in a black dress and a black hat, took all the photos of my father off the wall, put them in a suitcase, put it under her bed, and we never talked about him again. I think she thought if Sheila wants to talk, she will, but she had no idea of the conversation going on in my head. What did my father see in me that made him hate me so much in the end? When you're five years old, you don't process information very well. And I think it would be interesting to know some of your stories, because every single one of you have, you have a story. And some of you suffered a lot when you were really little. And when you have that kind of pain and you don't know what to do with it, you find a way to cope. You find a way to go on. You find some kind of mask, a place to hide. Sometimes we do it through a career or we try and dress differently or we try and we do it through all sorts of ways. I found the perfect place to hide. Christian ministry. I mean, who's going to come up to you and say, put that Bible down or we're going to have an intervention? Probably not going to happen. But God is the only one who knows exactly what's going on inside. And I determined I would become the perfect Christian woman if it killed me. And it very nearly did. I went to seminary to train to be a missionary in India because I couldn't think of anything I would hate more. I really thought that would make God happy. If I chose something that I clearly didn't want to do, that would show God that I was giving my life to him. I then came to America. I was signed to an American recording label. And then I was invited to become Pat Robertson's co-host. But inside, nothing had changed. I was the same scared little girl who wondered what God saw, what my father saw, that made him turn on me and determined that God would never see it and that I would never allow anyone else to get close enough to me that they could see it too. I was very well-known and very lonely. To everyone else, it seemed like I had all my ducks in a row, but God knew the truth. And one of the things to me about the fiery, outrageous, merciful love of God is that He is committed to pursuing us into a real relationship, not just pretending, but that we'd be really known. If I'd had my choice over how God redirected my life, I would have had him take my fear away. But instead, he decided to allow the very thing I was afraid of to happen, to show me the truth of what Paul, when he wrote to the church in Rome and said, I am convinced that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. I went from one morning being on the 700 Club 
And by that evening, I was in the locked ward of a psychiatric hospital. I was 34 years old, exactly the same age as my father. I remember on that first um, morning when I had to meet with a psychiatrist, and he said, he asked me a question. He said, who are you? And I, want, I could see my name on his pad, and I wasn't in a good mood because here's a little piece of insider information about psych hospitals, which I hope you'll never need, but one never knows. In psych hospitals, they only serve decaf coffee. If there's ever a moment in your life when you need a decent cup of coffee, that would be it, but no, we don't want to get the loonies restless. So I was already not in a great frame of mind, so I just said, Sheila, Sheila Walsh. And he said, no, Sheila, I know your name. Who are you? Um, I'm the co-host of the 700 Club. He said, no, Sheila, I didn't ask you what you do. Who are you? I said, I have absolutely no idea. And he said, I know that, and that's why you're here. I discovered that sometimes God will take you to a prison to set you free. And that some of God's most precious gifts come in boxes that make your hands bleed when you open them. But inside is what you've been longing for all your life. A relationship with God based on nothing you bring to the table. I finished my little talk in Palm Springs, and I suddenly thought, I don't know how you finish a talk. I mean, a song, you know, go, comes to the end and you leave the stage. A television show, they roll the credits. I thought, how do you finish? How do I get off here? So this is basically what I did. I mean, I just kind of said, okay, well, that's about it. I'm not in a big hurry, so if anybody wants to talk, I'll be around. The end. Yeah, proud moment. Interestingly enough, the very first person who came up to talk to me was the stunningly beautiful blonde who took off her gold cuffs and showed me where she'd slit her wrists. And I thought, some of our masks are just more expensive, but they serve the same purpose. So let me ask you a question. If when you walked in here this morning, instead of the worship team or whatever on the big screen, what we had specially prepared for you this morning was a movie of your life. Everything you've ever said, everything you've ever done, the things that you've never actually done so you don't consider them a sin because you just thought about them and never did it. But it's all up there on the screen for anyone who wants to watch. How would you feel? Because the radical truth of the gospel is that God has seen your movie and he loves you. There's absolutely nothing about you. The darkest, shadowy places, there's nothing that God does not already know, has not already paid for, and wants to welcome you to come into the light and be known to just tell the truth. My son is 17 and so starting to look at um, colleges. But when he was 10, we just finished lunch one day and I was... Um, washing up dishes, and Christian said to me, Mom, would you make me a flask of hot chocolate? And I said, yeah, sure, babe. Are you going outside? It was kind of cold. And he said, no, Mom, today I am running away from home. I said, well, that's huge news. Thank you so much for telling me. And I said, do you mind me asking, did I do something or did Dad do something? And he said, no, no, Mom, it's nothing like that. But think about it. There's you, there's Dad, there's the dogs. Nothing happens here. If I don't leave now, I will never have stories to tell. <laughs> Excellent point, I said, as I prepared his hot chocolate. And I said, do you mind me asking where you're going? And he said, north. I'm heading north. <laughs> and I said, what are you going to do for, for money, babe? He said, oh, don't worry, Mom. I intend to return home on weekends. Huge relief to me as his mother. So I gave him his hot chocolate and he's packing up his backpack with his soccer ball, the dog's blanket, his flask, everything. And heads out the back door. So I'm like, well, stay in touch. Traveling mercies. And off he went. <clears throat> so I ran upstairs and I'm watching in the balcony because I know I can kind of watch for a while. And he walks away around the lake and stops by a tree where he and I like to fish. And he sits down, gets out the blanket, has some hot chocolate. And I think, now what do I do when he moves on 
So I thought, well, I'll get the dogs and I'll take them for a walk. I'll try and stay far enough back. And if he sees me, I'll just say, oh, so sorry. I had no idea this was north directionally challenged. <clears throat> but after a while, I realized what he was doing was he was actually coming home. So I ran back downstairs and I'm just, um, you know, tidying up in the kitchen. He walks through the back door and kind of smiles at me, muttering under his breath, good times, good times. He's a strange child. He's very like his father. <laughs> so that night, after he'd had his bath and he was in bed and we'd said our prayers, I said to him, Christian, tell me about today. Did you enjoy your adventure? He said, yeah, I did, Mom, but I think I would have liked it better if my bag wasn't so heavy. It made me think. Wouldn't it be sad to live this blood-bought life make it all the way home, and for God to say, did you enjoy the journey? And us to have to say, well, I did, but I think I would have enjoyed it more if my bag wasn't so heavy. What would it have looked like if when you walked through the doors this morning, all your stuff became visible? Not your backpack and your books, your stuff. The internal baggage that you carry through every day the disappointment, the shame, the fear. What would that look like? And if you had to drag it to your seat, some of you would be surprised by how much you're carrying, perhaps disappointed by how long you've been carrying it. But my question would be this. If you saw it, would you want to take it home? Would you want to take it back to your dormitory room? Or would you want to take Christ up on that ridiculous, glorious exchange? Come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I could stand here and promise, promise you I won't for a million years and never begin to touch the depth of the love of God for you. Not for the guy beside you or the girl in front of you, for you. To be able to go out into this world, whether you end up as being president of the United States, whether you end up making movies, whether you end up being a teacher, whether you end up, whatever you do, if you learn to become a daughter of the King of Kings, a son of the King of Kings who tells the truth, you have to be able, first of all, to make peace with what is true. And that is that we are not the good news Jesus is. It's actually a bit of a relief. You don't have to get it all right. He has made you all right. You just get to show up and be who you are. When Christian was four, I had him backstage with me at one of our events, and we'd had a birthday party for a cameraman, and it was a big chocolate cake, and once everyone had had some, Christian said, Mom, can I try an experiment? And I said, sure. It was a short experiment just based on him putting his face in the frosting, and it was very successful, very successful experiment. And I thought my mother-in-law had taken him back to the hotel to get changed and into bed, but as I'm about to go on stage and I had on a cream suit, I will never forget it, I hear this little voice behind me saying, Mommy! And I know he just wants one more hug before he goes to bed, and so I, I knelt down and I opened up my arms and I hugged him and I knew what was going to happen. I knew I would get frosting on my hair and in my suit, but it was absolutely intentional because I wanted to say to my boy, you don't clean yourself up to come to your mother because you don't clean yourself up to come to your father. You come as you are. I just want to say thank you so much for the privilege. I don't take this lightly. I want to also tell you that when I leave here, I'm going to continue to pray for you because the power in this room to change the world is amazing, but it starts with you getting it in the depth of your soul that as you are right now, you are loved by God. You have never lived an unloved moment in your life. God bless you.